Hi everybody, so I'm going to do heating control. Now the problem with heating control is it's like shopping in your supermarket. I heard on the news that kids these days, when they go shopping in the supermarket, where they think cool food comes from is the supermarket. Uh, and when they do something like take them to visit a farm, they're actually quite shocked that these little animals running around end up in plastic packets. And the food actually comes from farms, not the supermarket. This is a, a huge realisation to kids. And the thing about wiring resistive heaters, it's not that different. When you start to look at stuff, so how many of you have actually taken apart a toaster or a kettle or an iron or a light? I know lots of people will have done, but I know lots of people won't have done. If you take those things apart, the one thing that's going to blow your mind is how simple they are. And that's the thing about resistive heating. It's really stupidly simple in its basics and to do. But to understand it, we need to know a little bit more about it. The little bit more we need to know about it is Ohm's Law. <laughs> because the minute you mention something like that, which is really sciencey, it scares the bejesus out of a whole load of people. But Ohm's Law is a really very basic thing. Because there are three factors involved in resistive heating and using electricity to do it. The voltage, the ampage, and the resistance. You get those, hold of those three things, you're going to understand it. And Ohm's law relates those three things to each other because there is a relationship. So the traditional way of looking at electricity is like water in a pipe. It's pretty useful to think of it that way. Another way that I like to think about it is rocks on a hill. If you have a bunch of rocks on a hill, and you want to roll them down to the bottom, then it will depend how steep the hill is. If the hill's very steep, they'll roll easily. If it's very shallow, it's very difficult to get them to roll. That steepness of the hill is the voltage. There is some level at which the rock will roll all by itself, and that's the voltage where a current will pass. So the rocks are your amps, the hill and its steepness is your voltage. And of course, Hills aren't smooth, they're lumpy. The more lumpy it is, then the harder it is to get the rocks to roll. The hill needs to be steeper until they'll roll because the hill is lumpy. If the hill is smooth, of course, it's going to roll down really easily and you don't need a very steep hill to make it roll down. So how lumpy they are is the resistance. The rocks are the amps and the steepness of the hill is the voltage. So that's kind of a nice way to think about it at this level. Now Ohm, bless his heart, did an awful lot of work on this stuff and he essentially measured it. And he spent ages measuring it and he came out with this little formula to tell us how a rock will behave on a hill depending on its steepness and how lumpy it was. So the lumpiness is the resistance, the steepness is the voltage, and the current are the rocks and that's where we get V equals IR from. Voltage equals resistance times the current. All it means is if we have a certain voltage with a certain resistance we will get that amount of current. It must be true because the hill is so steep with so much lump and so the rocks will roll down. If it's not that, they'll just sit there and so you won't get any current because there's nothing that can make it go down that hill. Another way of looking at voltage is the push that you give the rock to actually make it start rolling. So these are essential concepts to understand and get hold of when you're thinking about resistive heaters. So how does that help when thinking about resistive heaters? Well, Amps we can't control, they're, they're just what we're given. Amps in fact are a measure of the number of electrons passing a point at a certain time. Amps are a physical thing, the electrons zipping past. It's the electrons that do the work, it's the electrons that carry all the energy from point A to point B and then do something and unfortunately those we can't control. We can control the voltage and the resistance. We can make the hill steeper or we can make it rougher. That will in itself control the amps. 
steeper it is, the more will flow. The smoother it is, the more will flow. The rougher it is, the shallower it is, the less will flow. So by changing voltage and resistance, we can change how many amps. But the amps itself, we can't control. We only control voltage and resistance, and that will fix how many amps will flow. Now the amps, the electrons, they're the ones that do the work. When they're moving past something, they're rubbing. And of course, when something rubs, it gets warm. Just try rubbing your hands together. They get nice and warm. The more amps we have, the more electrons we have rubbing on something, then the hotter it's going to get. So having enough amps to get it hot is what we're aiming for. Having not enough amps so that we melt everything into a greasy spot is also what we're aiming for. The way we do that is by controlling resistance and voltage. That will change how many amps flow past. Now the reason that's important is because we live in a real world. And in the real world, our electricity supply, if you look underneath the stairs and have a look at the consumer unit, will have circuit breakers in it. And those circuit breakers have fixed amps that they're allowed to draw. On a lighting circuit, you'll see six amp circuit breakers, which means if you draw more than six amps, then it's going to flip off and you're going to lose your lights. A plug circuit is 32 amps, and then there are special circuits that do have different amp rating circuit breakers. But what it means is the electricity supplier only wants you to have six amps through your lighting circuit, because that's all you're going to need. But it's also all you really can draw, so you want to limit it to six amps or less. Now, of course, it's a lighting circuit, so you've got lights everywhere. So the whole thing on that circuit, normally there's a couple of them, actually. There's a downstairs and an upstairs, and quite often you find another circuit run to things like your shed and your conservatory. But you only want six amps drawn on that at any one time, so you have to limit the amount of amps that you're going to draw because that's what your circuit breaker is going to give you. When you realise that, of course, you're going to trip your circuit if you give it more than six amps, you have to do something to make sure that you don't allow more than six amps through there. And guess what you do? You fiddle on with the voltage and the resistance. Now, of course, in the UK, we get a fixed house voltage at 230 volts. And of course, in uh, USA, I think it's 110 that you get. So your voltage is usually fixed by your supplier. So we have these two things that are fixed, voltage and ampage. We can't go more than six, and we're supplied 230. So the question becomes, what resistance do we need? Well, to get that answer, we can go straight to our Ohm's law and use V equals IR. So let's say we have a normal light bulb, like the old type, the filament light bulb, which is an incandescent lamp. That actually is just a resistor. It gets hot, and when it gets hot, it gives out light. It also gives out heat, but it is just a resistor. So if I plug in a 60 watt light bulb into my 230 volt supply, then it will draw 60 watts, which means at 230 volts, it is a quarter of an amp, more or less. Well, that's because the resistance on that lamp is going to be in the region of 920 ohms. As long as I make that little wire in that lamp, 920 ohms, and I put a 230 volt supply on there, all it can do is draw a quarter of an amp. And that's all it will do. And it will only do that because of that relationship between these things. It must do that. And that's why a light bulb, if you take it apart and look at it, you will see that it's effectively connected to two bare wires. There's nothing in between the house supply and a light bulb because there doesn't have to be. It controls itself because we have set the resistance at 920 ohms. It, it can't do anything else. And so a quarter of an amp, it isn't going to flip your breaker, because it can't. There is no other control needed for a light bulb than that. And a light bulb, of course, is just a heater. And if you take apart a lamp, what you'll see is the wires going in to the little prongs and nothing else, because that's all you need. It's the same with the kettle. 
you look at a kettle, a kettle is rated at um, 3 kilowatts. It's plugged into a mains supply. The mains supply will supply 230 volts at 32 amps. You don't want it to go more than 32 amps or you'll flip your breaker. So you want to restrict the amount of amps going through your kettle. At a 230 volt supply, 3 kilowatt kettle, what that means is it's going to draw 13 amps and it's going to have a resistance of round about 17 ohms. And that is all it can do because we have set it by setting the resistance that somebody ha something has restricts the amount of amps that can actually flow through it. That's all the control these circuits need. Now the reason it's all the control they need is because of the situation they're in. I mean, a light bulb like that, well, it's hanging in the ceiling in the fresh air and a kettle is bathed in water. When those amps come in, rubbing against the resistance, they create heat. They create heat at the rate at which they come in and how, how hard they rub. If it's a light bulb hanging in the air, of course, it gives that heat back out almost immediately. So the heat can't build up. It's given out. And it's fine to do that as long as it's in that situation. And of course, in a kettle, it's full of water. It can't get hotter than 100 degrees, whatever you want, until it boils away. It's why kettles should never be run empty, because they can get hotter. But once they're in water, they can't. Because all that heat goes straight into the water to make the water boil, which is what we want a kettle to do. We want to do, it, to do that as quickly as possible without tripping the mains, which is why they're three kilowatts. So all that heat, in that environment makes not one bit of difference and so because they're in the environment that's why they don't need any more control than that. So given we've got a fixed voltage supply and we want to restrict the amps the only thing we can really do is control the resistance so that we can control that whole situation. How do we actually do that? Well every material has resistance actually scientifically it's called resistivity Resistivity is a property of materials, just like height. Height is a property of people, but of course height different, differs from person to person. Resistivity is a property of materials, and of course it will differ from thing to thing, but all of them have got it. Resistance is something slightly different. Resistance is what's called a geometric property. Resistivity is fixed. But if you change the thickness, the um, size, the shape of that material, you will change its resistance. And what that means is a thinner wire has more resistance than a thicker wire, but the material has the same resistivity. But it's easy enough. All you actually do is change the size or the length of the material, so it's got more to pass through, and that will either increase or decrease the resistance. So, a thick wire with a very short distance has a very short resistance and a lot of amps is going to flow because the resistance is low. And you can see this, just attach a wire onto two terminals of a battery and you will melt that wire. We have a very high resistance and so if I were to grab hold of the terminals of a 12 volt battery, well, it'll do nothing at all because it can't flow because the resistance is too high. A short, thick cable can zip through there and melt the cable. A thin, long cable has a high resistance. Remember, resistance is a property of geometry, meaning how long, how thick you make it will make changes to the resistance. The thinner it is, the longer it is, the more resistance. The thicker it is, the shorter it is, the lower the resistance. This is true for every single material that there is. So if we know the voltage and we want to make sure only a certain amount of amps flow, then we set the resistance by changing the length or the thickness of the material that we're being, we are going to use, whether it's carbon or whether it's heating wire or whatever it is. Okay, all of that's great, but what's it got to do with temperature? How do we control the temperature? Well, heat and temperature aren't the same thing. Heat is the amount of energy you're banging into something. Temperature is a measure of the amount of energy you've been able to keep in that thing. 
When we have something in the bare wind, like a light bulb, and it's hanging there and it's blown around, then it can't keep its heat in, so its temperature actually isn't very high. And that's great. If we surround that light bulb with a load of insulation, the temperature will go up. The temperature goes up because the heat can't get anywhere, it can't go away, it's staying in one place. And because you're banging more and more energy, you're creating more and more heat and you're not letting it go anywhere, the temperature is going to go up. So temperature is actually more a property of what you put it in. Now of course there's a balance. If I were to bang a load of energy in there, high amps, that temperature is going to shoot up quickly because we're generating a lot of heat and we're not allowing it to go anywhere quickly and so the temperature will shoot up quickly. If I not put very much in there, of course the temperature is going to climb slowly because we're keeping it in there and putting very little in there. Now eventually, of course, that heat is going to leak out. Heat always leaks out. Heat always wants to go from hot to cold and it's going to do it. So there's a balance point somewhere where the heat leakage will balance with the heat input and that's the temperature that you're going to end up getting depending on the situation it's in. So if you stick a thermometer in a kettle while you're banging in 3 kilowatts of heat it'll never go more than 100 degrees until the water boils away because it's in that environment. So you need to get that balance right in order to maintain that temperature. So in the foot warmer that we made, when we just plug it in and turn it on, it's gonna reach about 26 degrees in that situation because there's nothing else around it. If I put my feet on it and throw a blanket on it, what I've done is I've captured the area where the heat can go to and prevented some of it escaping. Because I've done that, the temperature will go up. But the temperature will go up only to the point at which the heat input and the heat escaping balance each other again. And so that temperature is going to rise to about 35 degrees or so in a situation like that. Because we're not putting much power in there, we're just preventing the heat escaping. And so the temperature will go up a little bit. Now of course, that's not an ideal situation. Because you still want a bit more control in a situation like that. You don't want it to climb to something you don't want, you don't know, because, you know, where's it going to stop? And that's going to depend on how many quilts you've got in and how many sweaty feet are on that box. So, how do you control it when you've got a situation like that, when it's not at its natural balance point? Turns out, there's a few methods to do that, and they're as equally simple. The most basic one is, well, turn it off. The easiest way to turn it off is just pull off the positive wire because that's a little inconvenient obviously. So what you do is you put a switch in that positive wire. So the wire goes into a switch and then to your heating unit and you just have hold of the switch. When you press that switch it breaks the positive wire and then it rejoins the positive wire when you press it on. So you put a switch in there. Now the basic one would be switch in your hand, thermometer in your other hand, stick your thermometer up your feet when it gets hot enough, turn it off. Cold enough, turn it back on again. That is slightly inconvenient, and wouldn't it be great if there was something that did that automatically? And guess what? There is something that does that automatically. It's called a thermal switch. It's actually the same thing you have in your iron, it's the same thing you have in your cooker, and it comes as a little package about one centimetre square, and in there is a little switch. It's a bit of metal, actually, when it gets hot, it bends. That, if you put it on your heating pad, when it gets to a temperature, will open the switch automatically at that temperature. And you can buy these, they're about a pound each. Uh, and you get them at a huge variety of temperatures, from 20 degrees, 25 degrees, 30, 40, just this enormous range. You can get what you want, actually. And you put a switch like that onto the heating pad, connecting the positive and the heating pad, so it's just like a switch. It will do that automatically because it does that at the temperatures on the package which in themselves can be slightly inconvenient sometimes you want to vary that temperature because it will also do that only 
at that temperature and sometimes you want a range of temperatures for example in your cooker you want something that you can actually set to a temperature and then you want something you can change that setting to a different temperature and guess what of course they've got such things because there's one in your cooker so these kind of controllers can either be mechanical in which case they're a bimetallic strip or they could be digital now you find the mechanical ones you get in your cooker okay digital ones are the kind of thing you're going to be wanting to use for your project and digital ones don't use a, a bimetallic strip they use a thermocouple usually a k-type and of course when that heats up it creates a slight voltage and you have a little box that interprets that voltage as temperature so you have a temperature sensor which is your thermocouple and that goes on your pad that sensor goes into the little box that reads it as a temperature and it has a switch inside where it can turn off and on the supply. Now that's very common for low voltage applications with low amps because with high amps everything's a bit more stringent and what you find very often is something called a PID controller and these are industrial applications now and this is the kind of thing you're going to find in a kiln and what the PID controller does is it sends a message to something called a solid state rectifier. That's a solid state switch. That solid state rectifier can handle, well, hundreds of amps actually, some of them. Quite common is a 40 amp version and it turns that switch off. So your main power supply goes into the SSR, your SSR control goes to your PID controller and your PID controller gets its information from a K-type thermocouple. If you ever want to wire something like that together, I've done these videos on how to wire together kilns, but normally pit controllers come with a pretty little picture on the side of the controller telling you which bit screws into which bit. So practically, all you're actually doing is screwing the right connections together and making sure that your temperature sensor is on your heating unit. Now I often get asked, does it matter if it's DC or AC? And under resistive loads, no. Now AC doesn't have resistance, it has something called impedance. Impedance arises because of the sinusoidal waveform of AC. It has an unreal component and a real component. But in resistive loads there is no unreal component, so impedance equals resistance. What it actually means as far as we're concerned is there's no difference. You, you, you don't have to do anything. An AC or a DC work exactly the same. The only thing you really need to pay attention to is if you're using an SSR then you'll need to pay attention to it, okay? But if you're just doing a straightforward application it doesn't make a blind bit of difference for you because impedance and resistance are equal under resistive loads. Okay, so I, I appreciate that's a lot of information to give in one video. So in summary to control the output of any heating pad, there are three options that you've got. One is do nothing at all because you don't need to. There you're going to have to be careful with the temperature to a degree and that's going to be the environment in which it's working and you can work all of that stuff out using your Ohm's law. That's very unsatisfactory for people, so there's option two, which is put a thermal cutoff switch at a set temperature. That is just a piece of cake. It's really easy to do. You wire it in just like you wire a switch. And the third one, and this is where you're using really heavy duty stuff, where you want real control over the power setting levels. That one, then you're going to be using an electronic controller with a thermocouple. So, those are the ranges. Now, if you want something really, really basic, then you can have set temperatures that you can switch to, and you just do that by having a number of those set switches. So, say you want a high, low, medium, you just have three of those things, and you wire those in so that they will switch independently and cut the power off depending on which setting, high, low, medium, you've actually put. So, absolute piece of cake once you get your head around those kind of things and practically to do it it's follow the pictures and pay attention to what's written on the little unit that you've got so in practice dead simple in theory a little bit more complicated because you have to get hold of your ohm's law but ohm's law is really simple to understand and for resistive heating it doesn't matter you can still apply your Ohm's Law. Anyway, I sincerely hope this helped because I think that um, making your own heating appliances, particularly um, 
microclimate warmers, uh, heating your clothes, that sort of stuff. It's really simple, really cheap, really easy, and people worry about it because they can't get their heads around that sort of stuff. So I hope it helps, and thank you very much for watching.